Hi everyone, Rick Davidson here, game career coach helping you get paid to make games for a living. I want to start by thanking everyone who's left some comments and questions and thoughts and ideas from our first video in this series where I was talking about my philosophy on where to get started. My idea about game one, two and three and how you should approach those different games and what you should be looking to do at the very start. This video is all about the player experience which I believe is one of the most useful ways for you to create an incredible game, for you to design an incredible game, for you to tune an incredible game, to be thinking about the player experience, and also from a developmental point of view, I don't mean your own developmental point, but from a development of the game point of view, how do you go about making decisions within your game? And there's a real truth at the moment that there's never been a better time to make games the tools that are available, the engines that are available, the tutorials in terms of how to use those engines and those tools, the communities for support, the platforms to release on. You can release on the App Store, on Steam, you can get your games out there on console. There's so many ways to get it out there. So now is the golden time, I believe, to be an indie game developer. But it's also a time where there's tons of competition. And we hear all the time about the App Store is flooded and there's so many games and there's a bazillion games released every single day. Maybe not a bazillion, but a lot of them. And it can be very overwhelming. It can say to you, maybe you shouldn't even start. You can stop before you've actually started. And that's a shame. It's a shame to have that frame of mind because there's so much opportunity out there. There really is so many ways for you to succeed in getting paid to make games. And here's the truth as I see it. A lot of those games that are being pushed out every single day are missing the critical number one most important requirement for a game. They're missing the fact that you have to create a compelling player experience. There's tons and tons and tons of people that are making games that are just a couple of mechanics that are cobbled together. They're like, okay, I did some tutorials, I played around with a thing, I've looked at another game, I've cloned it, and boom, there it is. There's my couple of mechanics, play it. And when you play those games, it feels hollow. And often players can't articulate it, they're just like, oh, it feels blah. And what they're talking about is there's no experience. There's no excitement, there's no engagement on not being immersed. And as indies, we, we do one or two things. We just cobble together a blob of mechanics and say, there it is. Or we create some sort of massive, fully detailed, in-depth narrative about the you know, the princess is lost and we have to go through the journey of the galaxy and we have to, there's the 17 daughters of the king and, but what you see in the game is just like a, a little pixelated character and you're like, well, I, I don't, where's, the story is great in our heads, the, the creator of those games see the story, but it doesn't translate. Because again, forgetting about the experience. And all these things, when I'll tell you about the player experience and how I use it, you'll be like, oh, I get it, I get how it all fits together. And there's two ways that for you to be really savvy about your player experience will help you. One is you'll make a better game. It's, it's a truth, you will make a better game if you have a compelling player experience, a cohesive player experience. So that's one way. The other big way is that'll help your choices and decisions uh, in terms of where you prioritize your features, where you prioritize your scope, and also how you approach your marketing. And this is one of the secrets that a lot of people don't realize is you don't look at things modularized on your game and say, okay, here's the game mechanic, and here's the game art, and here's the game marketing, we'll do that, and then we'll do that, and we'll do this, and have them not join together. If you take that approach, it's really difficult. It becomes really hard to know what to do. But if you've got one thing that wraps it all together, everything flows from that. It becomes so much simpler. So that's what I want for you. That's why we're talking about this now, is to make a better game and to make it easier for you to develop your game. So let's dig in and have a look at the model and start to, to flesh out what I'm talking about with this player experience. So I'm gonna put up here, uh, and we'll see if I can actually fit it in there, the player experience, experience. And then underneath the player experience, we have a number of sub areas that I'm gonna draw badly and then talk about. <laughs> okay. So what do I mean by player experience? I'm talking about the mood. I'm talking about the feeling. I'm talking about the emotion. I'm talking about the consistency. 
let me give you a couple of examples of how uh, I've used player experience as the glue that holds, and these are the other components of your game and your development, we'll get to in a moment, how it, how it acts as the glue. When I was working at PopCap as the game director on our project, we looked at what were we making. We were making a hidden object game. That was what the studio specialized in, so that was the what our team did. And the success of our franchise had been based upon one very simple aspect, which is the joy of finding things. The joy of finding things. Now, it sounds really obvious when I explain it to you, like, well, of course you do that. But it becomes powerful when you say every single decision we make, design decision, design decision, and development decision has to support the joy of finding things. So we've got two features. One feature is uh, we're going to hide little things throughout the world. This was, uh, the game was Hidden Agenda, and this is one of the innovations that we had, hide things throughout the world, throughout the metagame world. Uh, and was it joyful finding it? And we thought, yes, it was, and it would be, and people would enjoy that, which they did. They loved it. Uh, and comparing that to another feature, which might be, say, for example, leaderboards, which, you know, it, it's an important kind of thing to have leaderboards, but which of those do we do first? Which do we put our time and energy into? Which do we hang our game on? It is placing things in the world, because that's the joy of finding things. So it, it shaped how we made our decisions. And if there was an object placed, we would never have it placed in a sneaky way, because then there's no joy. You're like, oh, you hit it behind the thing. Oh, that sucks. So it's all about like, ah, there it is. And that's what people had to say, the way our things were placed, the way the artists placed things it had to be, ah, there it is. As one example. Another example is, um, say, Gears of War. I like Gears of War because of the, the immersion that you feel within that game. And the player experience that they're creating for people is, I believe, is actual war. That's their their vision of the player experience is we want you to feel like you're actually in a war zone. And this goes down to all the little details they have in there. For example, when you're running, if you're running in, in some first person shooters, you're just like, doesn't matter, you just run. Do, 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 do. It's all about speed, bang, 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 you know, headshots, there's someone camping, gotcha. But in Gears of War, when you run, you hunker down and the camera comes behind you and it sways as if it's a war correspondent following you. And all the way through, it's even in their name, Gears of War. So it's all about war, 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 but not, uh, not sensationalized. It's, it's, they're attempting to give you that feeling, that emotion of there's stuff going on, you're hunkered down, like the mechanic, the main mechanic of up against the wall, that's what you do in a war. You're not up in the open hanging out. So everything fits, everything glues together. It feels cohesive because it's about the feeling of being in an actual war. So that's at the top, that's the player experience part. For you it might be fast paced action. It could be uh, over the top, it could be silly, it could be tense. Player experience can be any of these things. It should try to be a singular thing. You don't wanna have it, our player experience is action and drama and excitement and, uh, and thinking and puzzles. If you have too many, it becomes muddy. You wanna to try to keep it very focused on one thing. And then underneath there, it, it feeds into all the other aspects of your game, it feeds into the theme of your game. So say we're making a, an endless runner. An endless runner, it's set in Egypt, uh, and we've got this really cool mechanic where you can dodge slow or fast, and we kind of think it's neat. So that's, that's our simple indie game we're working on. And uh, in terms of the player experience, what are we going for? Maybe we're going for um, frenzy. Maybe we're going for frantic. Maybe we're going for panic. Yeah, that one seems like it could, that seems like it could stand out. You know, it doesn't just have to be joy. People don't just play games with, oh, joy and skipping through the tulips. They play games for that experience. So what if we're making a game which is about, we want to give people the experience of panic. Then everything you do in your game has to support that. And see how, I don't know if your brains are going already, but for me, I'm like, oh, I can do this, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that development-wise, the ideas start to flow because we've got this, all comes back to that. So theme, what supports panic? Well, it wouldn't be just running through Egypt just on a nice sunny day. It would be, uh, you know, without story, without characters, without artwork. We want to support panic. So it could be um, everything's crumbling, it's falling apart. 
we've got the, uh, some sort of time, maybe there's a huge big monster that's, you know, a kraken, is that what you would have in Egypt? Maybe not. <laughs> maybe it's a big sphinx, and it's chopping stuff down, you know, stuff. Carnage would support panic, right? Doom would support panic. Okay, so that's theme. And then we also use it to support, and this box is not created too well, features. So what are the features? When I talk about features, I'm talking about the mechanics. Mechanics. And I'm talking about the tuning. If we're trying to create panic in our endless runner, then we'll create mechanics and tuning that support that. We want to have things that maybe it's like a, a double tap to go left to right, because the feeling you get when you tap, that, that's kind of, there's a casualness to that, right? But if you make someone tap twice, they have to do that quick. What if you made them tap like five times to go super low? D do you feel that in your body? When you have to tap five times, you get panic. So that's supporting our player experience. Now, if, if we made a player experience and we went halfway there, okay, we'll make panic, we'll have this theme all about panic, and then the features, we'll have it kind of smooth and it ramps its way up and you get more deliberate and more careful players won't like your game as much. Bloggers won't like your game as much. It's, it's a truth that if you're inconsistent with the player experience, people feel a bit off. But when it is all consistent, then they feel it's, it's an awesome game. And this is one of the things, you, it's hard to know about game design. You don't, you don't read this so much in a book as it is you feel it in your gut as a player. Okay, features. Uh, and then it helps with your development. Development, it's totally gonna to go out of this box here, apologies for that. Development in terms of your, uh, your priorities. Uh, in terms of your tasks, in terms of your schedule, those kind of things. Uh, so priorities, do we work on feature A or feature B? Well, which one is gonna support panic? Oh, feature A, cool, we do that then. Uh, in terms of the specific task, how long do we invest in it? How much time do we put towards it? So it really helps you know uh, how to make choices, how to make those low-level choices. Do we spend a ton of time in making our game look like the most beautiful game ever created? Well, probably not if we need panic. We want to have, probably want to have particle effects, lots of explosion and bling and over-the-top noise. That might be more important than, than kind of beautiful textures. And then finally, the big one is using player experience to help your marketing. This is one of those things, man, once I figured this out, it made my, my communication, my marketing, my emails to YouTubers and bloggers, made everything so much simpler. Marketing. Marketing. Okay, because when it comes to marketing, you, you know what to say. You know what to say. For example, our player experience, not just our theme, if, if we're talking about it's ancient Egypt and not just our mechanics, we're talking about Endless Runner. If you approach a blogger or a YouTuber or, or a forum or a community and you say, I'm making an Endless Runner in ancient Egypt, people will be like, oh, who cares? But you'll be like, no, no, it's a really good Endless Runner. It's like, ah. Oh. So you need to have something to do with panic. And you know I'm just using panic as an example, right? It could be a thousand different things. It could be tranquility, could be your endless runner. But for the purpose of this example, we're saying panic. Um, so panic, and then your marketing can support that. Be like, oh my God, holy crap, boop, there it is. You're like, what does that even mean? So you do things that support that. You have your character like, you know, there's a whatever, a, a boulder coming towards its head. And it's like, oh crap. The look on the, the guy's face is like, oh. all those things need to support it. and you. Go for emotion. Emotion sells. If you're just telling someone about your game, it doesn't do so well. If you have them feel your game, then it will do so much better. You'll get them excited about your marketing, about your what, if they feel something. And that's one of the big secrets of marketing, to have them feel. And in our next video, I'm gonna talk about how to really leverage that. What's the core? What do you really need to be giving to people when it comes to marketing? You know, we've talked now about the feeling, but but how? How do you, you know, how do you package that and give that to people so that they see your game, they know your game, they want to talk about your game? Anyway, I hope this video has been of service to you. I hope you've got something out of the player experience and our discussion about that. Any questions, any comments, I'd love to hear from you guys. Throw them in the comment box below. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for the next video about marketing. That'll be coming out real soon. Uh, I've got some great stuff to talk about there. Until next time, it's been lovely talking to you guys. See you soon.